I want to thank you for joining us for Women at Ardent today. We're going to be discussing building, shaping, and maintaining a positive company culture in times of change. And I'm Tyra Palmer. I am the Chief Marketing Officer for Ardent. I'm also the Executive Champion for Women at Ardent and Ardent and Diversity Inclusion at Council. And so we'd like to begin today, as we always do, with a connect to purpose. In seventh grade, Debbie Bryan was 13, and she participated in a reading program that included exploring career tracks. This is where she first learned about rehabilitation therapies. When she finished, she told her parents that she wanted to be a therapist and help people regain their independence. She has not strayed from that path, knowing it was what she was meant to do. She became a junior volunteer, enrolled in the Health Occupations Cooperative Training Program, Throughout high school, she trained, she worked as a therapy aide, and in college, she completed her degree in occupational therapy. Today, she is the director of the clinical operations at UT Health East Texas Rehabilitation Center. Quote, I've worked in the field of rehabilitation longer than most of my coworkers have been alive. I could feel that heavy, <laughs> the same way. Um, it just feel, it just, it still is just as true as when it was when I first read about the career at the age of 13. There is nothing more amazing than the strength of human spirit to overcome obstacles, and nothing more humbling than the opportunity to participate in some way in their success. I am thankful every day for these opportunities. And Debbie, we're thankful for you. Thank you for sharing your why and your passion for caring for others. So I am uh, really happy to announce this today. It's been long coming and we've talked about it, but we are officially launching our pilot mentoring program, Elevate and Engage. The goal of this mentoring program is to foster relationships in the workplace and help members grow personally and professionally. It's a simple user-friendly program that helps facilitate matches between the mentor and the mentee with step-by-step -step instructions. And the formal partnership in this pilot program is designed to last six months, but we certainly hope that your mentoring connections, if you participate, will continue beyond that. Um, at the end of the six months, we're gonna evaluate the program, the process, the criteria, get feedback from those that were our first cohorts of participants. Um, so we'll also offer a chance to apply for the program again early next year. So this program is open to exempt employees with one or more years of service. If you are applying to be a mentee, uh, you will need to review the manager's endorsement form with your manager and, uh, and ensure that they're endorsing you with this program and uh, also complete an interest form. And that helps us match uh, you with a mentor. And the forms can be found on the website or you can use the QR code that is on the screen right now. If you're applying to be a mentor, uh, you just only need to complete the interest form. So we'll be matching these individuals through this program in August and you'll receive a follow-up email from Women at Ardent. Some of you, we do have some who have already completed the interest form, so we're going to be reaching out to you with next steps. But again, the mentees and mentors will be joined together based on the skills and the leadership competencies that one exhibits and the other would like to develop. And we'll also provide additional resources to help you through this process. So if you have any questions, as usual, just use women at, at ardenthealth.com and we'll help answer those. So I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel Hostetler, and I am a talent marketing specialist and a member of the Women at Ardent Steering Committee. And I'm very excited today to introduce you to our speaker, Ellen Havdala. She's manager, managing director of Equity Group Investments, or EGI, uh, Sam Zell's company and serves on the Arden Board of Directors since 2019. Ellen also currently serves on the Board of Equity Distribution Acquisition Corp. and Lanter Delivery Systems. As a Managing Director of EGI, Ellen represents EGI in finding potential transactions and identifying new capital sources. She has helped establish and is responsible for overseeing Zell Global Entrepreneurship Network, an organization that provides continuing education and mentorship for students and alumni of three entrepreneurship education programs sponsored by the Zell Family Foundation. 
Previously, Ellen was a financial analyst with the first Boston Corporation in New York, earned her uh, in New York City. She graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts from Harvard College and earned her Master of Divinity degree from the University of Chicago in 2016. So thank you for joining us today, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. So Ellen, first off, thanks for joining us. We seldom get a guest uh, in the office for one of these, so I appreciate you coming in for it. I uh, mean, Tara, as you know, since I joined the board three and a half years ago, I've been a huge fan of Ireland, huge fan of its people, and uh, particularly its mission. Oh, that's great. Well, we're going to get started and get this kicked off. This is a, a little bit different than what we normally do as a fireside chat, so I hope you appreciate that we're trying to stay close to microphones and see each other. So um, let's, first question, <clears throat> how can a great culture impact a company, an organization? Um, well, I mean, great cultures allow companies to attract top talent, um, and it perpetuates itself. So top talent then promotes the great culture, um, but the inverse is also true. A uh, bad or a toxic culture is going to drive away good talent. Um, and once you have bad culture, it's really hard to turn it around. So, Right. I, you know, I know we've been talking about this leading up to it, but one of the things that you and I have shared is there's a Deloitte study that came out that said that 94% of executives and 88% of employees believe that a distinct culture uh, is important for the success of a business. And I know that's one of the things we strive here is to have a distinct culture. So how would you describe what you consider to be positive attributes of, um, of a good positive culture? So that's a great question. Before I answer it, I'd actually like to hear what people in the audience say. Can you guys put that, um, put your ideas in the chat box and we can read a few? So again, uh, attributes of a great culture. It'll pop up as a word. So we're going to wait for a second or two and have it populate. Oh, that's a good one. Understanding. Oh, these are great. Responsiveness. <clears throat> Oh yeah, keep putting them in. You guys have great ideas. Some of which I think we might be talking about today. Oh, these yeah. are great. So communication is clearly a theme. Great right. communication, that's terrific. Oh, optimism. That's one that we haven't talked about. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's perfect. Accountability, trust. Terrific. I think these are all great. Really appreciate Oh, respect. Uh, that's great. Um, so uh, mutual respect is always one that I start with when I talk about culture. Um, I think that strong ethics uh, and, and good values are also critical. And if these are important to a company and to its senior leadership team, it guides you know, not only how uh, colleagues treat one another, but also their approach to the entire um, way they do business. And um, the, the best example that I have is actually one of Ardent. Um, as you all know, Marty joined us two years ago and when he joined, um, he asked if I would come with him to his first hospital visit, or maybe I offered to go with him to the first hospital visit. We ended up going to New Jersey, and he and I walked into the emergency room, and one of the head nurses in the emergency room came right up to me and said, I need to say thank you. So I threw my mask, I gave her a funny look, I said, okay, and she goes, thank you, because in the peak of COVID, when no one knew exactly like, you know, what was causing it. We had all these patients. Frankly, we were overwhelmed. All of a sudden, we had a group of nurses come from Oklahoma. And not only was it like the cavalry coming to help us, but they came in and they knew how to use Epic. They knew our procedures. And so they were helpful, helpful for the minute they got here. And so thank you. And I just looked at her, I said, that's a great story, but I had nothing to do with it, nor did the board. Yeah. That's the culture of Arden. It's one of a you know communal purpose, a unified purpose, mm -hmm. and they have volunteered to help. And I don't know yeah. what better culture there is than uh, the Arden nurses who have displayed that. Yeah. Well, what you might not know, um, which I think you know, I'm proud of too, many of those nurses that received the Calvary in, in turn volunteered and went to our southern states as well, to Oklahoma and Texas, when COVID peaked in those markets. So. Okay, so I didn't know that. Yeah. Again, it's just you know a great example of how the culture at Arden really is reciprocal. Um, that's an amazing story. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's uh, also comments, I want to talk about equity a little bit too, because we have a great culture. Um, 
you know, there's a common saying that if you don't study history, you're bound to repeat it. And so, as uh, was mentioned earlier, I've been at Equity Group for 32 years. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm sort of known as the corporate historian. And what I try to do, and particularly with um, our newer people, is sprinkling stories from my 32-year history because we've had some tremendous successes. But we've also stumbled here and there. And so as long as you keep talking about these things, then hopefully you don't ever make those same mistakes again and you perpetuate what has worked and, and what's been successful. So it's a way that we um, you know, help our newer people learn and also keep the culture alive. So you're talking about that, but like in the end, like we you and I have discussed this, we've debated within internally, like, who is responsible for company culture? Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely everybody, yeah. um, but it starts at the top. So for us at EGI, it starts with Sam. Um, and Sam makes it really easy because he talks about our culture all the time. He doesn't talk about it necessarily as culture, but he has these things called Samisms. And actually, knowing we were talking about culture, I brought yeah. the book. Sam has this little red book. Um, and uh, in it, they've just taken some of Sam's favorite sayings and um, and put them in there. So, I'll give you a Samism or two. So, oh my God, I wish I could see better. Uh, you have my glasses. <laughs> nah, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, here's a great one that talks about our culture directly uh, The enemy is without. Um, so, in financial firms, you often have a lot of internal competitiveness. You know, everybody wants to do the best deal, mm -hmm. everybody wants their deal to make the most money. Um, we don't allow that kind of behavior. And how we stop it is that we each work on um, each other's deals. So if I have a deal and it requires financing, there are one or two colleagues that I always grab because they're really good at it. Some of our colleagues say, hey, I'm working on this deal. Ellen, your network is huge. Can you give me a person or two who can help us in this specific arena? And because we're all working on each other's deals, it's not my deal or your deal. It's always our deal. And so, you know, it, it really, um, you know, it's because Sam has set the standard of we are going to work mm -hmm. together. So if you look at it, uh, pull another one here. Um, the last one, conventional wisdom is nothing more than a uh, reference point. And so, um, you know, uh, if you think about it, like, here's a great example. We're working on a new deal and a term sheet's going out, and there's boilerplate language, same language you use in every term sheet. Well, on my deal, there was a boilerplate um, point, and I just said, can't have it in there. And the lawyer said, no, no, that's standard, Alan, you mm -hmm. have to use it. And I said, I had a deal five years ago where that tripped us up, and it made for a bad relationship between us and our partners mm -hmm. that was very difficult to get over. And they're like, but everyone has this in. I said, you know what, take it out, and we'll negotiate something that's fair with our new partners if we end up doing a deal with them. So it works for them, it works for us. But conventional wisdom would say, no, you have to have it in there. We look at it and we say, it doesn't work for us. And that's the other thing that Sam does, is he gives us the confidence to trust our, our own thought and to voice our own thoughts, you know, which a lot of places don't allow for. That's right. Well, you know, it's when we became a part of EGI, um, a while ago, I was given a red book sitting on my uh, desk, and um, so when you pulled yours out uh, earlier, I wanted to bring mine, and I just thought this is also um, a, a little bit of, unless you're the lead dog, the scenery never changes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? So uh, not taking one's uh, self too seriously either. Though that's Sam's I mean, 11th mean, commandment. Oh. So, yes, he says it all the time, thou shalt not take yourself uh, too seriously. Um, and, uh, you know, we do have a lot of fun at Equity Group. I mean, I've told you that people make fun of me because um, if there is music, um, I always break out to dance. And it's not attractive. Okay, I'm going to say that right now. <laughs> I, I just don't have to get up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you've actually seen it, Sam. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's part of not taking yourself too yeah. seriously. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that we've also learned is you need to instill the culture immediately. The minute somebody joins, they have to understand that there are just, you know, corporate values, you know, that, that are the standard. And you know better than anybody, the senior leadership team here at Arden has changed dramatically over the last two years. Um, and what's so amazing is that everybody that Marty's brought on embraces a culture of mutual respect, of positivity, of diversity, you know, and it's really terrific. Right. But it's not an accident. You know, Marty has been unbelievably intentional um, to ensure that the people that he hires, you know, will positively affect the great culture mm -hmm. that we have here. Right. Well, and our owners and our leaders. 
for uh, sure. the board has supported that. And um, I want to shift a little bit because when you talk about culture, not only, you know, we as healthcare givers, but, you know, industries, uh, you know, across the U.S. and the world, we've seen a shift in workplace and in challenges. But when I really think about healthcare, I think about burnout and the, all of the things. And, you know, I'd like to know oh, it's one or two things that every one of us can do uh, to help um, support culture and a culture of belonging and a culture of respect, as you talk about it and collaboration, you know, when everybody's on one team together. But, you know, what's one or two things? So, I mean, I don't think uh, any company more than Arden knows about challenging workplaces over the last two years. I mean, you guys really have been, you know, in the center of it. Um, and as I've mentioned, you know, there's a terrific culture here of teamwork and a unified sense, uh, unified goal of, of healing people. And, you know, to me, there's no higher calling than that. Um, and whether you're a frontline caregiver or you're here at the corporate offices, every art employee not only, like, knows that they're responsible, but truly is responsible for the care of, you know, our patients right. and for one another. So I think that, you know, having a unified goal would be mm -hmm. one specific example. Turning to EGI, our company, you know, during COVID, um, maintaining a strong culture was, was a little trickier because we weren't all together, at least in the beginning. And so what we did was we turned to daily meetings um, and we actively encouraged our colleagues to work together um, and to come back to the office as soon as they were comfortable doing so. Um, because we also know how important human interaction, human you know, communication, right. the human touch is. And a real danger over the past few years was getting isolated. You know, isolation and losing your sense of community, your sense of belonging, um, was uh, uh, really a risk mm -hmm. that you know we weren't willing to accept. So we actively made sure that everybody like felt like they were part of the equity group family throughout the last several years. Right, and I would say um, one of the things that that we've been purposeful for our, uh, about too is to ensure that you know we're staying um, really focused in on in our purpose and what we do yeah. um, and. And I know that you've talked about, you know, just really sitting there and, and understanding that part of that culture is just actively listening sure. to one another, for and sure. particularly the needs. Yeah. You know, sometimes we just don't slow down for that. Yeah, um, I think we've been good about that at, at Equity Group. The other thing we've done is make sure that we didn't lose all, like, the fun stuff we did. So two weeks ago, we had our summer party. Um, you know, and, and I know it maybe sounds silly, but just like letting people yeah. get together and, you know, blow off some steam with, you know, some drinks and some food and some music. Um, I think things like that really help. And so we've, you know, had our, our Christmas parties and our summer parties. Yeah. And, you know, thankfully, thankfully, we were still able to do that during COVID. Well, you know, I've been in healthcare for 30 plus years and um, we love to be fed. I can tell <laughs> you that no matter what. No, matter no why, wonder I was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, switching a little bit, we're talking about culture and the one or two things that every one of us can do. I think each of us have probably been in a position where you know somebody and they just don't quite fit. Yeah. They don't quite fit your culture. And, you know, how, how do you manage that? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to turn it back to Marty again. Um, Marty has a great saying, and it's change people or change people. Yeah. Um, so Mark Sotir, who is the chairman of Ardent, he's also the president of Equity Group, he took over um, as, as our president six years ago, and there were a couple of colleagues um, that we had that were talented, but frankly, they didn't support the culture. Um, they didn't feel part of the team. And over the course of his first few years, you know, he encouraged them to maybe go other places. And I, I think that sometimes, no matter how talented someone is, yeah. you have to let them go if they're not going to be, you know, um, consider themselves part of the team. That's right. And, you know, one of, I, I do think going back to that's one of the reasons why we continue to, um, to just remain connected to our purpose, why we say it at each of our meetings. I know just being here at corporate, you know, I, I have been in healthcare for a number of years and had the uh, ability to work inside the four walls of our hospitals and our clinics. And But to understand that each of us impact what's happening at the bedside Absolutely. and at the clinic is really important. Um, at the beginning of the webinar, you know, we talked about Elevate Engage, our mentoring program. and. Um, you know, I, I look at the credentials that Rachel, listen to the credentials that Rachel Hockstedler uh, read off. So, um, you know, 
Who's been a mentor in your career? Um, mm. Yeah, so first of all, I'm so excited about the program, and I can't wait to hear how it turns out. Um, mostly because I've been the beneficiary of some unbelievable mentors. Uh, do you want some specific examples? Or? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so um, when I graduated college, I went to First Boston, as Rachel said, um, which is now Credit Suisse, and I had no idea even what an investment banker did. Um, I frankly went to Credit Suisse because my friends were all going there, and I figured I'll just go where they go. Um, and so... Uh, Early on in my career, I, I heard this big booming laugh um, and, you know, found out it was the gentleman that uh, I was going to be working on my next deal with, and his name was Bio Ogun Lacey. Um, Bio was a Nigerian-born, Oxford-educated, Harvard Law School, Harvard Business School um, graduate who also um, was a clerk on the Supreme Court for Thurgood Marshall. Literally at that time, the smartest, just an underachiever, right? But the <laughs> smartest guy I ever met, and I and, and also had that big booming laugh, which showed you just like you know how how yeah. you know comfortable he was with you know how he treated people, and um, so I was like, wow, I need to learn from this person. And so um, when I went into his office with a bunch of other people to hear about the deal, I saw stacks and stacks of paper everywhere. And it turns out I learned that Bio read every document for every deal he worked on, which was pretty unusual for an investment banker. They usually left a lot of that to the lawyers. So I went back to my desk and I printed out, or actually in those days you ordered, I ordered every document for the deal we were working on. And I went home and I read them. And it was a stack of papers this big. And next day I sort of timidly like knocked on Bio's door and I just, and he's like, yeah, can I help you? And I'm like, I read the documents and I have some questions. Well, he was a little startled because I don't think an analyst had ever come in his office and said, I read the document. So he said to him, he said, Bio, you know, look, at, I, I read all these documents, and this one doesn't agree with this one here, and this one doesn't agree with this one here, and I have a question here. And I walked through all of the things that I found that were inconsistent. He looked at me, he smiled, and he said, never seen an analyst uh, ever read through the documents. And from that day on, he put me on every deal that he worked on. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I was the beneficiary of that. Yeah. So he took me to meetings. He taught me. And the quid pro quo was he knew that I was going to read every document on our deal. So he might read the first draft and the last draft, but he didn't have to do all the interim ones. So I actually helped him, and that's how I got him to be my mentor. If you turn to Sam, I mean, look, at I worked for Sam for 32 years, so obviously he's a mentor. There wasn't a seminal moment like that where, you know, where I became his mentee. But, boy, over the course of 32 years, you know, he has taught me so much, and you know, you talked about active listening. There's no better active listener that I've ever seen than Sam Zell. He doesn't have any screens in front of him when he's talking to people. He doesn't have his phone. He listens to people. And, um, you know, it's a really great skill. And it's one that I've tried to embrace. He reads five newspapers a day. Um, okay, I only read two, but I do read them cover to cover. And just patterning myself over, you know, like, yeah. like watching what he does and trying to learn from that. And if you look at anybody that I've ever, like, you know, considered to be my mentor, the common traits are, you know, number one, they just really are super smart, um, you know, way smarter than I am. Um, and more importantly, or equally importantly, they have very high levels of integrity and very strong ethical compass. So if I'm going to give you all just, like, one piece of advice, if you're going to find someone to be your mentor – just make sure it's someone who you respect how they carry themselves in the world. Because not only you know, are you going to learn from them, but you're going to be associated with them. And so um, don't underestimate how important that is. Well, I think what I've also heard you say is a willingness to step out um, mm -hmm. and, and to seek those individuals and to align yourself with people that you can learn from. Um, but also, you've got to trust them. Right. For sure. I mean, you know, the amount of feedback that I got back from um, Bio and Sam has been you know, tremendous. Some of it wasn't easy. I mean, yeah. you know, when you're young in your career, you sort of do some stupid things and you probably like, don't really know what you're doing. So, um, you know, but I always knew that it came from a place that you know, wanted to help me succeed and grow. And so if you're a mentor, you know, just make sure that trust exists. Make sure that people know that you're only doing it to help them be more successful in their future. And if you're getting that feedback, you know, look at, I know it hurts sometimes, but take a deep breath in and understand that it's coming from a place, you know, that's going to help you. So, um, you know, don't don't shy away from right. it. So the the mentor and the mentee both benefit for sure from it. And so, how does that impact a company, a company's culture, when we support mentorship? 
Um, well, I think it makes people feel part of a bigger team. You know, I think that in a lot of places there's, you know, leadership and then there's everybody else. Um, right. And I think that when you can break down those ties by having, you know, the mentors um, and, and the mentees working together, people feel part of the, the bigger purpose. Right. Um, some of you guys are going to uh, work with a gentleman na named Mike Spatina. He's our newest colleague, and um, he's working with us on, um, on Ardent, and he's absolutely terrific, so we have the benefit of his great skills. Um, and so how we're helping him is by bringing him to our meetings, by letting him take the lead where his skill sets allow. Um, and if you do that with your new employees, um, then somehow or another they like are able to morph into yeah. you one day. That might take him, you know, 20 years because I'm 25 years older than him. But, you know, if you don't do that and you don't invest in people, it'll never happen. And yeah. so, you know, um, it really is important uh, to be intentional about yeah. it. And, and I think with our, you know, we what we found out in 2019 when we surveyed, uh, women at Arctic participants that mentorship was uh, was a great opportunity uh, to help support us. So this purposeful piece. So, you know, I think when we talk about in the end this whole piece, um, active listening and sure. mutual respect sure. are some key takeaways to help build a positive yeah. culture. Um, you know, being authentic. Um, you know, whether you're dancing down a hallway or not, right? You will not see me do yeah. that. There, so no worries, guys. Uh, maybe with a, enough uh, notes in the chat, we can get you to dance. But um, <laughs> and then you definitely talked about seeking out people yeah. to learn from mm -hmm. um, and finding that person that you know that you can trust, but you feel as if it's going to help pull you along and elevate you and lift yeah. you up. Um, and then you know. We did talk a lot about just a common purpose and making sure that everybody is aligned with that common purpose and, uh, and connecting to it. And, and I think even from, if we look at it from a department level or a managerial level, um, just, you know, always saying what that true north is and defining for people. Um, so I, I want to uh, thank you. I think that, do we have time, Rachel, for a couple of questions? Yes. If people have some questions that you'd like to post to Ellen. Um, so what are some ways that we can foster a strong company culture in a hybrid work environment? Uh, because we've been seeing them. Yeah. You, you, talk, you talked about, um, you know, your daily meetings and huddles. Yeah. You know, we do have um, many people who work in multiple states where we don't even have um, a presence. Um, I think it's that intentional side. I shared with you that you know, we just try to do um, an activity that really lends itself to what you all know as the water cooler conversations, where it's maybe pausing from work um, and just, you know, talking about families, you know, For sure. what's yeah. happening in it. Yeah. Um, but I think what's important, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, no, no, but you know, the, the question actually does, you know, put hybrid in. And I think that the hybrid always has to include being in the office at some point because, you um, I think, you know, people love to work from home, but I'm not sure if they fully recognize how isolating it is. And so getting into the office, you know, connecting with your colleagues, talking to them, again, sharing, you know, the, 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 the vagaries of, of being at home during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and for people that aren't comfortable coming to the office, God, make sure you reach out to them. Just, uh, you right. know, I, not just because, you know, you have like a, a work thing, but take a moment at an off time to just call and say, hey, how you doing? You yeah. know, how are you feeling? Um, we miss you, we care about you, and just wanted to check in. Just being intentional. Yep. Um, I I'm gonna love to hear this answer. Um, can you explain why you went to Divinity School and how that experience has impacted you? Yeah, um, so uh, this is a topic I could talk about for the next 45 minutes, but I won't, you're not gonna be subject to that. Um, I have always known my creator in my heart. And from the minute I was born, almost. And um, what I didn't have was the language or, frankly, the intellectual um, like capacity to actually discuss like, what it is that I knew. Mm -hmm. So I decided when I was 45 to go to divinity school to just hear how people from all traditions, not just my faith tradition, but all traditions, talked about being in relationship with their creator. And uh, so it took me five years. It's a three-year full-time program. I did it part-time um, and then continued to work at Equity Group. Um, and so all I was allowing was letting my, you know, brain and my tongue catch up to what my heart already knew. Yeah. And so um, that's 
absolutely why I went, um, but the added benefits were that, um, you know, uh, the specific program I was in is called um, Master of Divinity, and to get a Master of Divinity, you have to take things like pastoral care classes. Um, well, I not only took the requisite pastoral care classes, but I liked it, so I took several pastoral care classes, and, you know, when I'm at work and people come into my office, um, you know, it's just so much easier to just sit and be intentional and to, like, give appropriate feedback because um, I'm not going to say I'm trained in it, but at least had a few classes that gave me some guidance on how it is that, you know, you can be more effective in helping people. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd like to say that uh, my three sermon classes helped me public speak, but I don't think that that shows here. But, yeah, I did take three <laughs> sermon classes as well. So, <clears throat> um, but no, I mean, it was a great environment at the Divinity School. You know, we really uplifted one another. Um, and then also, you know, frankly, it's important to, you know, follow what your needs are. And, uh, and then also having, you know, the work-life balance. Um, you know, I actually was down in Hyde Park a day a week, and I was really thankful that Sam allowed me to do that um, and continue working. That was a real blessing. And I know not all of us can be in that position, mm -hmm. but I, I know somebody <laughs> asked, you know, what advice do you have to promote balance of work and home life, especially given what we've gone through with the pandemic and it, frankly yeah, continue to do so? It's hard. I mean, I think that um, we've used the word intentional a lot. I think, you know, a, a lot of times you got to just do this. you got to just put this away. Um, and I think that that's a good start. Um, but, you know, I think remembering that, um, you know, there's a lot of fun out there to yeah. be had. Um, you know, work is critically important. That's why we're all here. Um, but curving out times of the day to do whatever it is that makes you uniquely you. <clears throat> what would you say? Um, I, I would say that um, the work-life balance is, uh, can be very difficult. You know, and I think about our workforce. We've got 26,000 employees. We have single parents. We have you know, individuals that are taking care of younger kids and taking care of their parents, so they're in that sandwich generation. Um, you know, so I would really lead into the fact that, um, you know, seek seek support for sure That's when you right. need it. That's you know, right. um, you're you're aware of this. My my mom passed away very unexpectedly. Tomorrow will be two years, and it was very humbling to me to reach out um, and to say, I need help. Um, and, you know, I, I'm proud of the fact that uh, Arden has an EAP and that we have services to provide that. But, you know, I, I would say that work-life balance, um, it really comes down to just um, being willing to trust somebody to ask for support and help when you need it. When you don't know how to do it yourself. So No, and, and I think you, you make so many good points there. Um, you know, a, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, people that had family, it was so easy for them because they weren't isolated. Oh my God, my colleagues who, you know, have family, they're like, I never got a minute alone in the yeah. last two years. I mean, and people like me who That's live how alone. my husband felt. <laughs> That's exactly how my husband felt. I didn't get a minute alone. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, but no, my only point is, is don't make assumptions. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody is going through something hard. And so um, another divinity school saying is, you know, give people some grace, give yeah. people some room and, uh, uh, and understand that we're all going through something. And so, um, you know, try to be understanding. That's right. Um, let's see if there's anything. What is the best? Uh, how do you measure a strong company culture? How, how would you measure it? Um, well, why is it important to measure? That's number one. You know, I would say just look at the people there. So, I mean, if you see people with you know high integrity, um, you know, who are working together, um, strong teamwork, that to me is a company that has great company culture. Um, I have done a lot of interviewing recently. Um, it, actually, in, in your industry, I've done a lot of interviewing, mm -hmm. and I'm hearing of places where people are like running for the hills because they're saying our culture has gotten, you know, it has gone bad because we forgot that our mission is to put the patient first, yeah. and um, you know, I, I can't be part of that. So um, I think that it's it's not a, a, a numbers measure, mm -hmm. but boy, you know it when you see it. Yeah, you do. And I think, you know, one of the things that we really try to, to, to capture with a company culture is feedback from our employees. Oh, that's good. You know, that's, yep. that's one way. I mean, Marty just announced last week, you know, we were at the corporate office, um, you know, 
uh, with a lot of great, awarded some comparably, you know, best CEO for women. Oh, Carolyn just um, told me that yeah, today, which is yeah. outstanding. But, you know, I think those are some of the pieces uh, that can help do that. And then yeah. certainly uh, retention, you know, bringing people in and investing in them, what you've been talking about and making sure that we're touching base, that they're not working in the office, the ability to touch base with them, see how they're doing. I, I think um, you're seeing it here, though. I mean, as we're interviewing people, I mean, People want to come and work at art, and if that's not a comment on our corporate culture here, I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, healthcare is tough right now. I mean, it's really tough. Absolutely. And we've got, you know, what we talked about earlier, burnout and other things. So I think, you know, we need to also be more agile um, in individuals and help better support their needs as we can hear them and learn about them. Um, all right, let's see. Is there, do we have time for another question? We do. All right. Um, what is the best way to grow within a company when you are rarely in the office due to working from home? I'm new to Arden, and I do not know many people yet. And we do, you know, I appreciate that question. And it's a, a tough one. one. It's a real concern. It, it is yeah. a real concern. And I've actually had folks on, on my team that, um, that we started working uh, our team remote for a period of time, even prior to COVID. Um, and so, you know, going back to what we talked about a little earlier, making sure that you're participating in activities, participating in events when they do occur, if, they, if you are able to come uh, into the office. But, you know, one thing that I would uh, encourage is to try to find a buddy, um, mm -hmm. you know, within the department. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we do try to pair people uh, so if your manager has not done that, that might be something really good to, to do and to ask for. Um, because I think they can not only help you find the way of like, okay, how do I fill out a PTO form, uh, right? But also just things about learning who each, you know, one another. And, and it is hard to understand truly the culture when you're not, I think, here full time. Um, so we create our own culture, uh, I, I even think so. virtually. You know, I and I want to go back um, to my bio example is... To the extent that you're on a call and you see that you can help somebody, um, you know, even if it's not your like full time job, yeah. offer to help people. Um, people rarely say no. If you say, "Hey, I've done this before. Can I like you know? Can I do something for you? Or can I help out here?" Um, it's the easiest way to connect with people yeah. in my mind. Um, and I think that you know, I attribute a lot of my success for my willingness to just jump in and do. Mm -hmm. So um, I know it's a little bit harder over Zoom, but you're going to hear something on a Zoom meeting one day, and you're like, wait a second, I've heard that before, and I've worked on it. Like, can I just, you know, yeah. help you? Or being that young analyst who yeah. says, let me just order the documents and see yeah. what's happening. So um, I appreciate um, the time that you've spent with us today. And I don't know if you have, um, I have a little bit of closing piece. Do you have anything Please. you want to add? No, just thank you all very much for letting me do this. Uh, it's a real pleasure. I was thank telling you. Tyra and uh, the other ladies in the room that um, I haven't had any public speaking really over the last three years. There's minimal stuff over Zoom. And uh, I was a little nervous. So uh, thank you all for, uh, you know, helping me do this, my, my first one, and getting some of the rocks off. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. And I hope that um, we found some quick insights for you all to walk away with. Um, if you guys don't mind, use the QR code to complete the post-session survey or click on the link with the WebEx chat. The survey really helps us plan for future uh, sessions in terms of topics, speakers, or suggestions about how women at Arden can better support you and or your team. Um, I, I do, again, want to thank you for, um, for being here today. Um, I, I want uh, you to know that those of you who have team members, that uh, if they were not able to participate, that we will be emailing out this recording. So, you know, take time, if you can, with your team to look at the webinar or encourage others to do it. Um, our next webinar, and I love this title, I'm so excited about this, is Imposter Syndrome. Ooh. Overcoming, you might want to watch, Overcoming to Self-Limiting Beliefs, and that's Friday, August 26th. Um, and so it's going to be back from noon to 1245 with Tracy Spears. And we're going to send more information out about that. But the title itself, um, you want to go ahead and sign up for. Yeah. So thanks, Ellen. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Thanks. Guys.